Guess where I am? I'm on top of the needle. Oh, what needle do you think I mean? Yeah, that's right. You don't believe me? Well, let me show you. Seriously, thousands of visitors to this very spot have been making long distance phone calls like that in the past two weeks. For Seattleites have been getting a preview of the most spectacular attraction at the World's Fair. They've been riding up to the top of the Space Needle where the observation deck is already in business. The restaurant isn't open yet and won't be until April 21st. But on this telecast, you're going to visit the already famous Eye of the Needle and watch the dress rehearsal of the fine service that will soon be offered in the world's highest revolving restaurant. Our television cameras are now stationed at the base of the needle, in the restaurant, and here on the top. And we're ready to bring you one of the great stories in the building of a World's Fair. It's the story of a private venture by a group of Seattle citizens who caught fair fever and built the best known symbol of the Century 21 exposition. There's little doubt the Space Needle will become the symbol of the city in both the 20th and the 21st centuries. I'm Bill Nielsen, and this is another view of the world of tomorrow. <laughs> World of Tomorrow, an inside view of Century 21, the Seattle World's Fair. It's about a 45 second ride from the ground for two of the Space Needle's three elevators. And that in itself is a memorable experience which you will enjoy vicariously before this telecast is over. Once on top, every World's Fair visitor will see almost startling proof that nature provided Seattle with an incomparable setting for a city. From the top of the tallest building west of the Mississippi, you can stand in one spot and scan the horizon from the Cascade Mountains to the Olympics. Did we say building? To tell the truth, they hardly ever make buildings like this. A three-story building standing on three steel legs, the lower floor 500 feet in the air. It seems hard to believe now that early last year the builders still didn't have a site for their tower and that ground was broken here just one year ago. The site finally so selected is near the eastern edge of the fairgrounds at Broad and Thomas Streets, about halfway up the needle on the north side. All of the fair except for the science pavilion is spread out below. Although it happened largely because of the availability of land, the location seems like a happy choice now, especially for the preview package of a monorail ride and a trip to the top of the needle. Privately financed by a group of five local people, the Space Needle cost well in excess of four million dollars. Although not exactly an orthodox investment, this is a business venture. And through more than two weeks of limited operations, it has already lived up to advanced billing. Already before the fair opened, 100,000 people have been to the top of the needle. <laughs> I've been talking with Mr. Alfred Fast, who is the project's architect on this Space Needle project for John Graham and Company. When did the work first begin on this project uh, design-wise, Al? Well, we started to design about spring of 1959. How did you arrive at this particular design? This was a long, drawn-out process, going through many, many designs, sketches, and choices of materials, type of towers, concrete or steel. We had uh, square towers and round towers, some of them supported by cables or guide, until we finally evolved this design and material. Well, I, for one, are very, am very delighted that you arrived at this particular design. It seems to find a lot of acclaim. Does the tower sway at all in a high wind? Yes, it does somewhat, of course, because steel is, after all, a flexible material but it is not noticeable to people up here. And uh, when we checked it during construction, we found that in a 53 mile per hour wind, the actual deflection was only about a quarter of an inch. What are the maximum conditions that the tower will withstand? Wind-wise, it will take, uh, is designed for about half again as much as ever has been experienced in Seattle on record. And uh, earthquake-wise, with which many people are concerned, it takes about double the seismic load 
as the city of Seattle Code demands. Considerably higher in both cases than provided by the city far code, correct? That. Far beyond that. Well, I've enjoyed very much talking with well, you. Thanks pleasure, so much Bill. for being with us. Visualize, if you will, the situation here only last April. The Space Needle Corporation had acquired from City Light a piece of land 120 feet square, and that was all. As tests proved, the land provided an ideal footing for the tower, and the work began. Howard S. Wright Construction Company, prime contractors, dug a Y-shaped excavation 30 feet deep. At the bottom, before the main floor, concrete pads were put in position for the anchor boats. The excavation was laced with 250 tons of reinforcing steel and 72 huge steel anchor bolts for the legs, in addition to another 24 for the tower's core. The bolts seen here are actually four inches in diameter and over 31 feet long. A group of anchor bolts like this for one side of a double leg weighed 12 tons. When the anchor bolts and the reinforcing steel were in place, they began the pour. 470 truckloads of concrete came to the site in one 12-hour day, the largest continuous building concrete pour in the West. 5,600 tons of concrete. The foundation is far heavier than the 3,500 tons of steel in the tower. In fact, it's so massive that the center of gravity of the whole structure is very near ground level. That is the solid base of safety that was designed into the Space Needle. And from the base on up, the same extra margin of safety was built into the tower. The largest wide flanged steel beams ever rolled were used in fabricating the leg sections. Three of them were welded together, flange to flange, to form a three-sided tube. And the tubes were then stiffened with diaphragms. A 90-foot section weighs 90,000 pounds. United States Steel Company's new structural carbon steel called A36 was specified because it provided 10% greater strength. Each of the Space Needle's tripod legs has two of these mighty triangular tubes joined at intervals by cross members. The legs angle up till they almost meet at the needle's slim waist. Then they flare out again to support the top house. The compound curve required in leg sections forming the waist presented a special problem, but it was accomplished by heating the beams in a precise pattern to produce the desired camber. Fabrication and erection was handled by the Structural Steel Division of Pacific Car and Foundry Company. Like most construction projects for the Seattle World's Fair, this one presented new and revolutionary problems. Pacific Car designed and built a special derrick crane for the job. It was installed inside the core, could rotate on its base a full 360 degrees at a capacity of 45 tons. As the steel core grew around the derrick, eventually it boxed itself in. About once a week, the crane lifted itself inside the core to a new level, and so repeated the operation until the project was completed. After the steel work began, the needle rose at the rate of about 120 feet a month. Columns throughout the full height of the tower are joined by high tensile bolts. From top to bottom, there are altogether 60,000 bolts in the complete structure, most of them one-inch bolts. About the only thing that delayed the work was a high wind, and even when the wind was too much for a long cable haul, the crews usually proceeded with some other work. Thanks to regular safety meetings and the determination of all hands, the towering symbol of the fair was completed without a single lost time accident on the job. The final big lift for the special crane was the stainless steel point of the needle, a gas lift beacon that will light up every 15 minutes after sundown during the fair. Hello, test one, two, three, four. Testing. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> We're on. With us right now, to my immediate right, is Harley Farwell, who is the project superintendent on the Space Needle Project, and to his right is Al Beck, project engineer, both with Howard S. Wright Contractors. First of all, Al, tell us something about this upper structure, will you? Well, we've got five floors up here in the top house. The restaurant floor is the first floor with one kitchen. The second floor is a mezzanine floor where we have uh, another kitchen and Western Hotel's offices. And the third floor here is the observation deck and then the mechanical room and the elevator machine room. 
Harley, after the structural steel work was completed, I believe right around the first of the year, what's been going on? Well, we've been busy uh, since that time before, actually, in getting these five fo floors built up here, uh, moving the concrete up, the uh, uh, building materials of various kinds. Big uh, job it's been, right? Yes, it has. How long did it take after fabrication to install the turntable for the restaurant? Well, it, the work uh, uh, took place over a period of about two and a half months, but the actual working time probably was around 21 days. Al, how many days exactly have you been working on the project? Two less than a year, 363 days. Well, I can say without equivocation that there have been more sidewalk superintendents on this job than there have been on any project in Seattle before. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Before determining the height of the top house on the Space Needle, view soundings were taken from a helicopter at various heights. The height finally selected puts the restaurant level at 150 feet higher than the top of Queen Anne Hill. Those who have already visited the Needle often comment on the fact that at this height, the hill is strangely flattened out. In any case, there's an unobstructed view of the panorama. Around the glass-enclosed pavilion of the observation deck, there's an outdoor promenade for those who like the wind in their hair. Altogether, this level on the tower will accommodate 350 people at one time. There are coin-operated telescopes on the outdoor rim to bring the mountains or the ships in the harbor even closer. And of course, this is the place where the shutter bugs are already snapping away at a furious pace. Who wants to miss such high-angle shots all the way around the horizon? Another feature of the Space Needle is the world's largest carillon. Some 39 stenters, about uh, 20 to 54 inches in length, are located at the 200-foot level on the tower. When the bells peal out, at times they may be heard as far as 10 miles away. Leading American and European caroliners will be invited to perform during the World's Fair. The Space Needle carillon has 549 bells and an elaborate console in a glass-enclosed booth at the base of the tower. Their work on the instrument is nearing completion now. As you can see, the performer at the controls will be in full view of the crowds waiting for their elevator to the top. With us now is Hogue Sullivan, the manager of the Space Needle. Hogue, you've had a little over two weeks now to check things out. How's everything been going? Very, very well. We're very pleased with it. What exactly is your responsibility here as differentiated from that of Western Hotels? Well, I say actually this is a three-story building and they've leased out the second story, but our job, as far as I'm concerned, is the crowd control, getting the people up to the observation tower and to the restaurant. How has the pre-planning worked out in actual practice? Well, it, it's been a lot of fun to watch because we've uh, planned a few things out on paper as to how they're supposed to work, and uh, we've been able to see them work exactly as they were planning. Have the crowds been up to your expectations in the past two weeks? Both in numbers and in enthusiasm, yeah. Do you feel that the flow of traffic will be all right once the door is open for the restaurant? Well, oh yes, I'm sure it will be, but our problem, of course, is taking care of the numbers that come to the fair, and we can't come close to taking care of all of them. But What will be the hours of operation for the Space Needle? Well, as of this broadcast, it's 10 in the morning till 2 a.m., seven days a week. And how many people do you plan to accommodate uh, per hour during that period? Oh, I think we'll run around 1,350 an hour. And from what we've seen so far, you're going to handle the job beautifully. Let's for just a moment turn around here and take a brief look at the city of Seattle and give the folks on out in television land, as it were, an opportunity to see what we see from here. It's a beautiful view, and we're sure that all within our reach are going to find this one of the most spectacular exhibits of the fair. Well, from the preview so far, I'm sure you're right. Thank you, Hogue. Okay, Bill. You are watching another facet of Seattle's World of Tomorrow, the fantastic Space Needle, which is already a famous symbol of the Seattle World's Fair. Even before it was completed, this elegant steel spire had become one of the most widely known and recognized structures in the world. And now it's time to show you what the spectacular elevator ride is like. Although you naturally have to be here in person to get the full effect, for specially designed high-speed Otis elevators ride up the sides of the triangular core of the needle at a speed of 800 feet per minute. Vertically streamlined, shaped like a capsule, the elevators have vision ports above the four-foot level. 
which gives you a view of the earth falling away beneath you. Inside the core, there are two sets of 832 stair steps, but they're not likely to be used as they're designed for emergency purposes only. I've been talking here with Harry Mulliken, who is the Western Hotel's officer in charge of this Space Needle project. Harry, what exactly is Western Hotel's responsibility here? Well, Bill, in addition to operating the Eye of the Needle restaurant, Western operates all the concession stands and the snack bar on this level. How many employees do you have? We will have over 300 employees. They've been undergoing quite an extensive training program, I know, which creates a great many problems for you and the other people in charge. Could you explain some of those problems for us? Well, Western has opened and operated a lot of restaurants, but this is the first time we've ever had one that was round and moved and also 600 feet in the air. I think this chart behind us here uh, illustrates far better than we could uh, verbally just what your problems are. Well, this chart shows where the foyer, where the guests will arrive. This area here, which is also in the stationary part, is our service area containing the kitchen. The outer ring is the portion that moves, and all the seating is located on the outer ring. This chart has a very practical use here, doesn't it? Yes, very definitely. It's much easier to explain to our employees how the operation will work by using this. Just how large is the eye of the needle, Harry? Well, we've used this comparison, Bill. If we would pick up the entire restaurant and take it downtown, we would not be able to get it into the grand ballroom of the Olympic Hotel. Without actually being here, it's difficult to believe that it is that size. Yes, it is large. We heartily recommend it to all within our reach. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you, Bill. In keeping with the simulated ride through space in the elevator, the starters are dressed in bright colored space suits. But in either costumes or decorations, the space theme ends when you reach the top. At capacity, the needle cannot be expected to handle more than about 25% of the total fare attendance during the six months of the exposition. Extra money was spent on overtime to get ready before the fair so that Seattle people would have an opportunity to go to the top before our visitors arrive. The early birds haven't enjoyed the plush service of the restaurant, but they could eat at the snack bar. Here, a battery of automatic machines make change for dollar bills, dispense fresh brewed coffee, ice cold drinks, hot sandwiches, and a variety of other snacks. Nobody anywhere on the fairgrounds will ever be more than a few steps away from something to eat. But of course, there's only one eye of the needle. This is the kitchen inside the ring on the main floor. Chef René Chis, seen in action here, has planned a cuisine befitting to the loftiest restaurant in all the West. Chef Chis brings to the eye of the needle 12 years of experience in leading European restaurants, and he has been sous chef, or the number two man, in the Olympic kitchen since 1959. Preliminary food preparation and dishwashing in this unique restaurant are located on the mezzanine floor just above us. Food comes down and dishes go up by dumb waiter. Although the kitchen is reasonably compact, the two floors provide more space than you might have imagined. Waitresses can enter on this level at either end of the moon-shaped room. And in case you are one of those who has the idea that the whole restaurant turns, this kitchen is just as stationary as your own. I'm happy. I've been talking with Jack Borg, who is the resident manager of the Eye of the Needle restaurant. Jack, how's the shakedown cruise going so far? It's going very, very well. I guess the employees have been go undergoing quite an intensive training program, haven't they? Yes, and they're all extremely enthusiastic. How long has this been going on? About a week now. I've been wondering, with the stationary kitchen and several hundred rotating guests, how in the world does a waitress find her customers? Well, it does present some problems, but we've uh, worked in a pattern on the core wall, on the stationary wall, which indicates which kitchen door is the closest. And then we have a clock-like device at each a door leading from the kitchen which indicates just exactly where what portion of the rotating platform is at that time. One big question in the minds of a great many people I'm sure is the cost of the meals here in the Eye of the Needle. The cost of the meals is no higher than in the fine restaurants around town. The, uh, we have a dinner minimum price of five dollars and a luncheon minimum of two dollars. Do you have a children's menu? Yes we have a children's menu. What's the price range there? A dollar fifty luncheon minimum and two fifty dinner minimum. Certainly reasonable, and I can say from what we've seen here, it looks like real delicious food. It is good food. I've tried it. Thank you, Jack. 
Our camera is now stationed in the reception foyer of the restaurant, looking out to the revolving ring. The foyer is part of the stationary core of the top house. As soon as the guests are seated, our camera will not be moving. Neither is the outside wall. As we hold in a fixed position, watch the table and the guests move slowly out of the picture. The moving portion of the floor has steel wheels that roll on two tracks. It's equipped with 48 anti-friction bearing rollers. Fully loaded, the turntable weighs about 90 tons. But believe it or not, a one horsepower electric motor keeps it turning. Of course, a reducer slows the speed by a ratio of 800 to one. And the motor thus delivers a force of nearly 19,000 pounds to the turntable shaft. Moving at this speed, there is no perceptible feeling of motion when you're seated at a table. But in one hour, you will move all the way around the circle and back to your starting point. We said a few minutes ago that the space theme ends when you enter the eye of the needle. This was deliberate planning on the part of Western Hotels and designer Don Robbins. The purpose was to create a distinctive, elegant restaurant with no more of gimmicks than the breathtaking horizon to horizon view. In decor, design, and cuisine, this was planned as one of Seattle's truly fine restaurants, not only for the fair, but for years to come. Bill Nielsen, our World's Fair observer, is now talking with John White, restaurant manager. As you may have heard, the functioning of the turntable is so smooth that you can balance a half dollar on its edge or stand a cigarette on its end. You realize you're moving only when you glance up after a few moments of conversation and see that your view has changed. Dress rehearsals will soon be over. At noon on Saturday, full-scale operations begin at the Eye of the Needle. Towering high above the myriad of other exhibits and extraordinary structures on the fairgrounds, the Space Needle stands as the symbol of a new day in the history of Seattle and the Pacific Northwest, destined to be one of the major tourist attractions of the region for many years to come. And it is an outstanding example of the way in which many people have contributed to the building of America's first Space Age World's Fair, now only four and a half days away. We'll be back in a minute to conclude the story about the Space Needle. This is Mr. Edward Carlson, the president of Western Hotels and the chairman of the Washington State World's Fair Commission. Mr. Carlson might well be referred to as the father of the Space Needle, and perhaps we can have you under or explain to us just exactly how this all came about, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Bill. Well, Mrs. Carlson and I were in Stuttgart, Germany, uh, May of 1959, and we had dinner in the television tower at that time. We were so impressed with that structure that we thought it might be nice to have one something like it in Seattle. And from that point, things began to happen, right? Well, when I came home, I had lunch with Jim Douglas one day, and that was encouraging enough that he and I went over to see Jack Graham, who has a wonderful reputation for designing some great buildings around the world. And then from there, uh, we were fortunate enough to have a group of citizens in this uh, community under the leadership of Bagley Wright uh, put up the money, and uh, this is what we have. We in Seattle will be eternally grateful to you and to all of the people who have been instrumental in this Thank project. You.